Services Incorporated or their affiliates. The following program is a PodcastOne.com production. He started in a small town in Texas. Worked his ass off to become one of the most famous wrestlers of all time. We're going to take care of business tonight, and that's the bottom line. And now he's dominating the world of on-demand audio, and he's doing it for the working man. This is a damn good outlet for me to spew the bullshit off my brain. This is the Steve Austin Show, Unleashed. Unleashed. All right, everybody, welcome to the Steve Austin Show. I am coming to you from the Main Street in Los Angeles, California today. I've got a hell of a podcast for you. Well, at least I think it's a hell of a podcast. Today I'm finally getting around to playing those phone calls where you guys called the studio a couple of weeks ago one Saturday night. And I tell you what, I appreciate you guys lighting the phones up. I didn't know when we put this out there because I forgot to mention it on my podcast, so I just sent out a couple of tweets that we were going to be opening up the phone lines, kind of like a fan appreciation type thing, and talk to you guys. I haven't done a call-in segment or a call-in show in a couple of years. And Stacy said, why don't we take some phone calls? And I said, you know what? That's a really good idea. But just the funny thing is we don't really have anything specific to talk about. Because if you remember back on that Saturday, there was a UFC fight on. Uh, I was missing that, and so the WWE pay-per-view was on Sunday. We couldn't talk about that. Monday Night Raw and Tuesday SmackDown hadn't happened, so we couldn't talk about that. So the questions were all over the place, and i tell you what, uh, some of the questions caught me so off guard, I was trying to rack my brain, trying to really remember some things from the past. Hell, I've been hitting the head with so many damn steel chairs. If I hadn't thought about it, it's hard for me to dig back and remember everything, so please bear with me on this uh, session of phone calls. As we move forward and start taking more phone calls after specific events that we are all on the same page on, and that's the subject matter at hand, I think it's going to be a lot easier for me. Uh, I am building out 317 Gimmick Street as my podcast studio the guys are over there uh, doing some renovations right now. They're painting the interior part of it. I'm going to turn it into my man cave. Also going to run a hard line in there so that I don't have to go to Beverly Hills or Culver City to take your phone calls. I can do it right here at my podcast studio. So we will be doing more of this in the future because I enjoy taking your questions and shooting the breeze with you guys. I appreciate everybody that called in. I didn't know just on short notice because I forgot to talk about it on the podcast that we were going to take those phone calls. And I was wondering if anybody was even going to call the damn studio. And I was hoping that you would, and you did. Hell, we had to shut the phone lines down. They were so jammed up. So I appreciate all the support. Uh, We are going to do this more often. And next time when we do it, it will be about a specific subject. So I don't got to rack my brain and search for information that's hard for me to come up with. I will know the facts and we will talk about uh, a pay-per-view specifically or whatever the task at hand is. Again, I appreciate you calling in. And if you didn't hear your phone call on today's podcast, there's two more shows that we got out of that session. I'll probably drop those during the filming process of Broken Skull Challenge in July and August, so I have a podcast already in the box. So if we didn't get to your phone call today, if you didn't hear it, it will come up on a future show. Thank you very much for your support. To those of you that called in, thank you very much. Also, again, today I'm talking with Wade Keller from Pro Wrestling Torch. We're going to talk for 15 to 20 minutes at the end of this podcast about Raw and SmackDown. And here's the thing. Right when I turned on Raw the other night to start watching, my direct TV went out. I will post a picture of my television screen on Twitter Thursday when this show drops. We had just finished watching the season finale of Better Call Saul. Everything was working fine and dandy on Sunday. We turned the TV on on Monday so I could watch Raw, and I was going to watch SmackDown, so I'll be able to talk to Wade Keller about all this stuff that we're about to talk about, and I didn't have shit. My wife started doing the troubleshooting, hitting the reset button. Then she spent an hour on the phone with the people at DirecTV. Couldn't fix it over the phone, so now some bitch got to come to my house and fix my DirecTV. Says my satellite wasn't communicating with the box. Anyway... I watched the highlights from Raw and SmackDown that I saw on WWE.com. 
I'll let Wade fill in the gaps. But then, with that being said, since I didn't get to watch both shows, we'll be able to keep this about 20 minutes. Wade Keller coming up at the back end of this podcast. Thank you, everybody, for your calls. Let's get to the phone calls now. We're going to start with Justin in Huntington, West Virginia. Justin, how are you? I'm good. How are you, my friend? Hell, man, I'm sitting here with a pair of headphones on, drinking some water. What's up? Uh, you know, just talking to my favorite wrestler. Hey, man, I appreciate you calling in the show, and I appreciate your uh, patience on the hold button over there. Hey, man, what do you want to talk about today? I want to see what your opinion is on Roman Reigns. Okay, with respect to what? As a wrestler and all the heat he gets from the crowd, what do you think about him? I think he's uh, he's got a great physique, good-looking guy, pretty damn good worker. Uh, Storylines have been kind of on-off, hot-cold. Uh, Roman Reigns in and of itself, I think he has a star written all over him. He's still got to find his way. He's still got to climb his way up the ladder. He's built to take the road. He's always in shape. He doesn't get uh, gassed out in his matches. There's a lot to like about the guy. So when it came out as the Shield, uh, you know, those three guys, him, Seth, and Dean Ambrose, first came out as the Shield. You know, they were really hot as heels. And boy, all of a sudden, yeah. they split them up. And, you know, Roman, I don't know, it just kind of came out of that. And all, all of those guys kind of had to find their way. And, you know, Vince kind of picked him to be the babyface. And because of the response that he was getting when he hit the ring. And he, he really draws your attention. If they get his storyline straightened out, I think the kid's going to be fine. I think they just need to keep running him like they're running him. He's doing good in the ring. I loved his matches with AJ. I think you keep him on the, uh, the road that he's on, and you don't turn him heel just for the sake of turning him heel to make the fans happy because you're not pushing him anymore. Because if you turn him heel, you're going to push him even harder. So then, if you were tired of him to begin with because he was over-pushed to begin with, in your opinion, then you're not going to like him as a heel either. So if he keeps going down the road in the fashion that he is, but then turns in an organic fashion, heel when the time is right, or just stays down the road, the kid's going to be just fine. He still has things to learn in the ring. He still has to work on getting to the top, top level but he's a top guy in my right. opinion. What do you think about him? Honestly, I love the guy. Every time he comes out, I'm just happy that he's there. He's a great wrestler. I love watching him wrestle, and I just hate that he gets such a bad reaction from the crowd. Man, you but, do that sometimes, yeah. and, and, you know, it's it's hard when you're out there and they're pushing you to be one of the, the baby faces of the company or the face of the company, and you get out there and, uh, you know, look, look, at, look at John Cena. Now, he's been on top for over 10 years and has had a career that's been absolutely phenomenal, but he still has those, sometimes those divided chants. But nonetheless, there's electricity in the air and everybody is engaged. And he has been able to have such a strong mindset to not get in his head and mess with him. That's the confidence of John Cena. I think that Roman Reigns has the same type of confidence and self-belief that he's going to weather some some of those bad chants, and he'll end up getting over for everyone as we continue to watch what rolls down the road. The kid's going to be fine. I think he's built to be a superstar, just got to be hungry enough to go out there and get it. I know the company is behind him, and I think he'll get to where he wants to go. Do you see a title shot in his near future? Here's the thing. The title doesn't mean anything right now. He just needs Justin to focus on the work, get on, get in a good, engaging storyline, and be Roman Reigns. F the title. Don't worry about the title. As Stone Cold Steve Austin, I didn't worry about the title. When, when, I, when I wanted, it was cool. But did I live and die by it? Hey, man, I got the title. I'm the world champion. No, I didn't. And I didn't really need a belt. If you go back to Jake the Snake Roberts, he was a guy that didn't need a belt. Roman doesn't need a belt. He just needs good stories, and he needs great opponents, and he needs to kick ass and show fire and execute. I hear you. Hey, I man, I appreciate you. you calling in the show. Can I get a hell yeah before I go? Oh, hell yeah. Thank you, brother. Thank you, man. Let's go to Sean in Tulsa. Hey, Steve. How are you? Ah, dang, man, I'm doing good. You calling from Tulsa, Oklahoma? Yep, yep. Hey, man, yeah. what do you want to talk about tonight? Let's get Let's get into it. Yeah, I wanted to see, um, a while ago I sent you a question when you had Jim Ross on the show that was asking, you know, what was the key most important factor in his decision to hire you? 
No, I was wondering, if you were in the position of hiring, what would be the most important factor you'd be looking for in a wrestler if you were making a decision whether to pull the trigger and hire him or take a pass on him? Man, I just, uh, when you meet somebody, do they really grab your attention? Is there any charisma to this person? And they don't necessarily have to be a good-looking person, just some type of pop factor or wow factor or attention-getting factor. As an entertainer, you, you look for those visuals, and then you meet someone and see if you feel that electricity when you shake that hand and start engaging that person. And then as you talk to them, see how their gears work, see how they talk, listen to them talk, do you feel them? That's what I'm looking for right off the bat. Right on, right on. It, may, it makes sense because people got to engage, not just to, with the crowd, but with the Today Show. I think you guys are talking about that with, uh, with Brian Kendrick. You know, it's not just can you do a promo, but can you, can you talk to different people on the peel on a mass basis? Man, I tell you what, when you talk about cutting a promo and just working, uh, you just made me flash back to you know, you're coming from Tulsa, home of former yeah. Mid South uh, wrestling from Bill Watts, one of my favorite territories. Yeah. But you look at a guy like uh, uh, Jerry the King Lawler, who came up in the USWA, and here's a guy that wasn't the biggest guy in the locker room, wasn't the best looking guy in the locker room, but it was a hell of a worker, hell of a promo, great storyteller. And it's like, okay, if you lined everybody up in the locker room, say, all right, man, pick the superstar. You might not pick Jerry Lawler, but all of a sudden when you watch the guy work, when you hear him talk and you see how dynamic and charismatic he is, it's like, holy smoke, here's our guy right here. It just happens, you know, many different ways. And, you know, Jerry worked uh, long and hard to get to where he was. And it, it's always amazing when I hear people say, hey, man, give me your five best talkers. And someone just you know, throws out five names. Uh, Jerry Lawler is one of the best talkers in the history of the business, period. End of story. Wow. And all the money that he drew down there in Memphis and uh, along with Bill Dundee and uh, that whole crew, it was just amazing. I segued off, but he was a guy, when you start looking around to try to find guys, it's not always going to be the biggest, best-looking guy that you find or the biggest, best-looking girl that you find. It's, it's a mix of a lot of things. And you as a fan, you know, what, let me ask you, what are you looking for in, in, let's call it, a WWE superstar for yourself? Um, I want them to believe what they're saying, or at least appear to believe what they're saying. Um, I want them to, you know, just appear genuine, and I want them to be, you know, like real hardworking. Like, for example, real quick, uh, I once saw um, you guys in, in, the, in the Civic Center in Tulsa, and I was really impressed um, with The Undertaker because it seems like he put every bit of effort in a house show that you would expect in a TV show. And then, you know, I waited around and, and saw when you came out. And you, sure enough, you were the last one out. And you were so engaging with the fans. I mean, you actually got up on top of the car and, you know, gave the, gave the one-fingered salute. And um, that sort of interest in connecting with people is if somebody seems to be too aloof and doesn't seem really to care then why should i care about them you, know? you want to believe in the product you want to believe in the storylines right oh yeah so yeah. you got to have someone out there god dang when they're talking they can't look like they uh you know they're just reading the script they got to believe that shit hook line and sinker and as stone cold steve austin as far as myself goes Man, I believed everything I said and did 120%. It was a shoot for me. Now, I was working in yeah. the ring, but, I mean, I considered that that was my world. I lived and breathed in it every single day, and hell, I damn near yeah. hated to go home. So that was a highlight yeah. for me to be able to go to those towns and work and do something that I love to do. And then, I mean, when Monday Night Raw showed up, holy shit, that was like, man, I was a kid in a candy store. So, you know, just <laughs> as a person on the roster, just that thirst and desire to go out there and resonate and connect with that crowd, that's all about, you know, getting you to believe, getting getting everybody else to tune in and watch the show. But, hell, I digress. I'm rambling. I want to thank you, Sean, for calling in. I appreciate it. No problem. Have a great day. Take care, man. Let's go to Elliot Buffalo. Hello, Steve. Hey, man, how are you? Hey, my question is, what would you do if uh, you didn't succeed in the wrestling business? Like, what would your job or hobby be? Elliot, that is an outstanding question. Before I got into the wrestling business, 
I was driving a forklift. I was loading and unloading freight trucks, 18-wheelers. I was doing heavy manual labor, pushing stuff on a cart. So that's what I was doing in 1989 before I got into the business. When I decided that I didn't want to take the management route that they wanted to take me to, the, the trucking company, I decided I wanted to be a professional wrestler, which was my dream from when I was about seven or eight years old. So I went to wrestling school, and I got into the business. And I'll tell you what, I did not have a plan B. I did not have an option to fail. Whatever it was going to take, I was going to bust my ass, apply myself, and try to succeed. And saying that, I didn't know how I would measure success. For me, success was just being able to pay my bills every week and every month and live and sustain myself like I was after I got finished playing college football and worked on a freight dock. I come from a middle-class family. My dad sold insurance. My mother hung wallpaper in people's house. And we were never rich, and we were never dirt poor. We were just kind of in the middle. And my parents were extremely thrifty, and they saved their money. And I adopted those same principles from them. So to answer your question, I don't know what I would have done because I didn't have plan B. I probably would have went up into the management ranks like the freight company wanted me to go. And it all turned out that I did okay. But I starved my ass off for a lot of those damn early years in Tennessee and uh, a little bit in Atlanta. And it was a great ride that, that, you know, ended a little bit sooner than I would have liked to. But God dang, I had a blast doing it. As far as just my hobbies and stuff like that, I used to have a ranch down there in South Texas that I like to go to. I like driving my tractor. I like working outdoors. I like riding my Kawasaki mules and my four-wheelers and stuff like that. And I like hanging out with my dogs and my wife. I'm pretty much a hermit in Los Angeles. Uh, got a sushi restaurant that I go to that's right down the road from my house. And I like to go to the shooting range just to shoot steel targets. And that's what I like to do. Thank you for telling me that. Hey, Elliot, Thank thanks for calling, so man. I'll catch you down the road. Could you say hello to my parents? Their name are Marie and Russell. Hey, Marie and Russell. Glad y'all called in and glad I got to talk to Elliot. I appreciate the support. Thank you. Oh, let's go to Brandon. Hey, Brandon, how are you? I'm pretty good. What do you want to talk about? Okay, if you could work with any professional um, general manager, who would it be? Man, general manager. What are my options? Shane McMahon, Stephanie McMahon, Eric Bischoff, or Paul Heyman. Man, I tell you what, that's a heck of a list of names right there. God dang, that's a hard one. But, Brandon, if you know anything about me, you know that I'm a Paul Heyman guy. When you look at that list of names, I have tremendous chemistry with uh, Eric Bischoff, with Stephanie, and with Shane. Shane has probably taken 100 stunners from me. I have outstanding chemistry with all of those people, but with Paul Heyman... Going back to my days in ECW, when he first helped me out, learning how to cut a promo, helped me focus, and helped me kind of define or start to really scratch and wonder who and what I was as an entertainer and not just be a guy named Stunning Steve Austin. I really enjoyed working with Paul so much. To answer your question, as a general manager, I would like to work for Paul Heyman the advocate for Barack Lesnar. That was well said. Wow. Hey, Brandon, thanks for the call. I appreciate it. Let's talk to Eric in Oregon. Oh, Stone Cold, what up, dude? Oh, hell yeah. What's going on? Oh, I'm sitting here with my roommate, college student, and watching old highlights from back in the day. Uh, you cook, you kicking the rock's ass, you know? Anytime I could get in there with the rock and light it up, it was a day off. It was like a day at the park, and then to pop a couple of cold ones afterwards. And I, and, and to top it all off, they was paying me for that shit. To work with the most electrifying yeah. guy in sports entertainment and then drink beer, pretty good job, wouldn't you think? Oh, hell yeah. What do you want to talk right. about tonight? Who do you got, or what do you got on the whole McGregor versus Mayweather thing? Man, that's a real interesting question because I know it's so current right now. 
to tell you like it is, I haven't watched a real boxing event from top to bottom in 15 or 20 years. Now, when I was growing up, you know, and Hitman Hearns, Marvin Hagler, Sugar Ray Leonard, uh, Roberto Duran, uh, Muhammad Ali, George Foreman. I mean, all those guys. I mean, I was a huge boxing fan. But it just seems like when MMA kind of crept up on it, it was just like boxing wasn't quite as exciting. And the guys, to me, uh, didn't resonate with me like some of the names that I just mentioned. So when I got into MMA a long time ago in the UFC, I started really watching more of that. So I know Mayweather is undefeated. I know he's uh, very good on defense. He's more of a, I think he's more of a counterpuncher, not really so much offensive-minded. That being said, he is undefeated, so he wins. Uh, but as far as McGregor goes, just from a strict boxing standpoint, I don't know. But I, I just know that McGregor is so dynamic and he's heavy-handed. I don't know if he can hit Floyd, but if he does, I think bad things will happen. I was watching an interview the other day. I think Mike Tyson says, that, hey, man, this guy ain't got a chance to beat Floyd Mayweather, but people will buy the pay-per-view. I think anytime someone's in a fight, anybody has a chance because it's a fighter's chance. And that's not, not knocking Conor McGregor because he's not a true, uh, just a boxer. I think that guy's a lights-out fighter, and his record speaks for itself. His accomplishments speak for itself. So it will be a spectacle. I don't know. I don't know how it will go down. What do you think? Honestly, yeah, I think I'm the same boat. I think if McGregor hits him, I mean, Mayweather might be in trouble, but Mayweather's just going to, as much as I'd like to see McGregor win, I think Mayweather's going to beat him. He's going to hit him and run away. Well, yeah, but that's kind of been his MO all along. And he's, uh, Jesus Christ, I mean, you know, he's he's made a lot of money doing this. He's uh, uh, one of the best of the best. And so I got tons of respect for him. But it'd be nice to see Connor go <laughs> And go out there and connect with a heavy right hand and, and, and knock him out. That would shock the world. That's what it would do. Like uh, Muhammad Ali shook up the world a long time ago, this would be shaking up the world in 2017. Oh, yeah. Hey, man, oh, yeah. I appreciate you calling, Eric. Oh, yeah. But can I say one more? Can I say two more things real quick? Yeah, go ahead. All right. How about that stunner on Stacy Keebler, though? Hey, man, uh, that's another day at the office. Drinking beer with Stone Cold. Uh-huh. You got to pay the price. Exactly. The center on JBL for not bringing, drinking with you either, right? Got to pay the price. I'm paying the bartender. You got to pay the price. Go yeah. ahead. All right. My roommate's got something to say. Hey, can you give me a hell yeah? Oh, hell yeah. Hell All right, hell Stone yeah. Cold. Appreciate it. Okay, I got more of your calls coming up, but first, got to take care of another longtime sponsor of the Steve Austin Show, and that's True Car. If you're in the market for a car, then you need to check out True Car. True Car gives you the price and information you need to feel confident about your purchase. When you register with True Car, you'll see what other people in your local area paid for the car you want. And from there, you can connect with a local True Car certified dealer and enjoy a more confident car buying experience. True Car shows you real pricing on actual inventory, so you see competitive pricing offered to you by True Car certified dealers for vehicles that are actually on their lots. And you'll also see all the dealer incentives before you get to the lot so you can feel confident about the price when you show up. True Car makes car buying easy, no matter if you're looking for a brand new or used vehicle. And the stats don't lie. Over 3 million cars have been sold to True Car users by the True Car Certified Dealer Network. There are over 13,000 dealers in that network with some 700,000 pre-owned vehicles available. So do yourself a favor and go to True Car for your next car buying experience. True Car doesn't just make the process easier, it'll also save you some money. True Car users save an average of over $3,000 off MSRP. So when you're ready to buy a new or used car, Visit True Car to enjoy a better car buying experience. Some features not available in all states. Hey everybody, this is Spike Ferriston from Spike's Car Radio. We're out here in the porch of uh, at the Malibu Kitchen at the Malibu Country Mart every weekend doing podcasts. My first guest is Jerry Seinfeld. He's right here. We're going to have Jeremy Piven. We're going to have Chris Hardwick. See you soon on Spike's Car Radio. I think he's over-projecting for a podcast. (laughs) (laughs) And I love to over-project for podcasts. Join me every week at PodcastOne.com and Apple Podcasts. Steve Austin, Unleashed. Unleashed. All right, back to your phone calls right now. Let's go to Derek in Twin Lakes. Hey, Steve. Uh, Awesome. This is pretty insane. 
when I'm talking to Stone Cold Steve Austin. It is insane. I'm sitting in a damn uh, broadcast studio in Culver City, California, right inside Los Angeles, and you're in Wisconsin, so will you want to talk about beer or wrestling? Because I know a lot about both. Okay. <laughs> or cheese. We've also got a lot of cheese. So. I tell you what, I can tell you a thing or two about cheese. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll do that sometime. Okay, let's uh, talk wrestling. What you got? Yeah, uh, so growing up, like my favorite wrestlers growing up, you know, I was born in 82, so just loved the Legion of Doom. Hawk was probably one of my, you know, my top five of all time. Uh, they seemed like legitimate, old-school, tough guys. Um, I was just wondering if you had any personal stories that kind of shed light on what they were what they were like or anything like that. Holy smokes, man. When you're talking about the Legion of Doom, you know, i got to go back to when those guys, uh, or, or at least my first recollection of, of them, when they were just wreaking havoc in the NWA as the Road Warriors. Mm -hmm. Holy smokes. Yeah. Those guys came out there that had them shoulder pads with the spikes, they had those uh the long uh tights, they had the makeup, the haircuts, and they were just like super jacked. And both yeah, guys were them. like imp like super impressive, but Hawk had those just insane traps. So dude, when the bell mm -hmm. rang, I mean they were just beating the shit out of damn near anybody they come up <laughs> with. And so they were flat out awesome. And then they go to WWE and they change them to Legion of Doom. Same thing. And here's the thing about the Legion of Doom. And I wish uh, Hawk was still with us and Animals is still with us. Yeah. But those guys are so nice. And uh, they were always forward thinking to me. And they were one of the best tag teams or, or biggest draws in the history of the business in, in the tag teams. But those guys, uh, they came up to me one time and I was a, a fan of theirs. And we got along on a personal level. And so they were very cool, and they, they were the ones, the Road Warriors. It was Mike, Hawk, and Animal were the guys that told me. They said, "Hey man, come here. We got an idea for you." They said, "Hey man, you got this WWF Championship belt, but you're Stone Cold Steve Austin. You ought to have your own belt." You know, I pitched that idea to oh, Vince, wow. and the, you know, we came out with the Smoking Skull belt, the famous Smoking Skull. Oh belt. wow! But it was those two guys that, that gave me the damn idea to come up with that belt, and. Hey, man, in the ring, uh, I got a chance to tag team with those guys. I don't remember working opposition of those guys, but they were they were tremendous. And those guys, as big as they were, if it was time to get the heat on them, they would sell for you, but you had to work for that heat because they were big, badass some bitches, and they would bring it. So when you got the Road Warriors down, whether it was a uh, hawk or animal, you better stay on their ass because they ain't going to sell for long if you did. They were always very protective of their gimmick and very smart about their gimmick. And I used to always love Paul Ellering down there at ringside doing his magic as well. So I, I, I think you picked out a great tag team. Those guys were awesome. Yeah, definitely. Do you think it's sad that, uh, like, today uh, we don't see a lot of guys being a tag team Forever. It's sort of a, a starting point to a, to a singles career. Man, I tell you what, you are, you are dead correct on that. For some reason, you do, you just don't see those lifelong tag teams. I, you know, I miss it because I love tag team wrestling. And the thing I love about it is you got four guys in there working with the referees. You got five guys rather than three. All the different combinations of things that could happen, drawing the ref, manipulating the crowd. All that stuff is there. Can, there's so many things that can be going on in a tag match. It's mind-boggling to jump off uh, LOD for a second and talk about tag team wrestling, like Dash and Dawson. Do you watch those guys down at yeah. NXT? Yeah, those guys are probably shit. That's probably the best tag team I've seen in a long ass time. Mm -hmm. And those matches that they were having with Champa and Gargano were just off the charts. So I really like those guys. They're a whole different ball game from LOD, but just as far as manipulation of the referee, things going on in the ring, that shit, those, those are two damn good tag teams right there. And I don't know, with Dash out with that broken jaw, what the future holds for those guys, but shit, you know, we'll see. Yeah, definitely. Hey, man, I appreciate well, you calling into the show. Yeah, thanks, Steve. This was uh, this was awesome, man. I appreciate you and everything you've done, and I, I love you, brother. All right? Hey, man, I appreciate it. We had some good times going through all them towns in Wisconsin, and uh, it's a beautiful state. Have a cold one for me. I'll catch you down the road. Will do. Let's go to Ryan. Hey, Ryan, how are you? 
Good. How are you? Hell, I'm doing excellent. Good. Well, hey, I just had a had a question, man. I wanted to see if you could drink a beer with anybody alive or dead. Who would it be? Boy, you talk about a hell of a question. Drink a beer with three people. Uh, let's go, John Wayne, Evil Knievel, yeah, Elvis Presley. Could oh, have been Steve awesome. Ray Vaughn there. He's from Texas. I know you call him from Houston, but man, I think you talk about a hell of a list. I think I'd have to uh, open the bar up and have about ten or fifteen in there. <laughs> You've been from Houston well, and uh, home of the Houston Texans. I tell you what, I'd like to have a cold one with J.J. Watt, one of the baddest defensive oh, players yes, in the NFL right now. Yes, sir. You a football fan? Absolutely, 100%. All right. Uh, any more questions for me? No, I just wanted to tell you thanks, man. Uh, thanks for taking my call. We're big fans down here in Texas. We appreciate it. Hey, man, I tell you what, I had a blast wrestling in Houston, Texas at WrestleMania 17 way back in the day because I grew up 100 miles south of Houston on 59 in Edna, Texas, and down there in Victoria. So when I got a chance to wrestle in that big-ass, awesome Astrodome, and we sold it out, 67,000-plus, it was like a, a dream come true. So uh, Houston is kind of like my, you know, the big city that was close to where I lived. So I appreciate all your support. Well, hey, we, uh, we just opened a restaurant, my company, in Denton, where you played college ball. So you can give them a, oh, hell yeah. What's the name of the restaurant? Let's give them a plug. It's uh, it's actually a big company called Raising Cane's. Raising Cane down there in Denton, Texas, home of University of North Texas, Mean Green Eagles. I think they're going to have a hell of a season this year. They're putting their program back together, continue to advance the offense and uh, get better on the field uh, on both sides of the football. So I'm looking for big things from my former team, North Texas State University, now University of North Texas. And that's the bottom line. Thank you, Ryan, for the call. And oh, hell yeah, to everybody down that restaurant. All right, let's go to Brian in Kentucky. Hey, Brian, how are you? Good. Um, my, my question is, if you could go anywhere uh, during summer, where would you go? Man, if I could go anywhere during summer, where would I go? Normally, I would say the Broken Skull Ranch, but I sold it, and summer in South Texas is very, very hot. You know what? I'm going to say Sparks, Nevada. I got a brother-in-law living up there. I'm living right smack dab in the middle of Los Angeles, California. Too much traffic. So I'd like to take my Kawasaki mule, go to Sparks, Nevada, and go on the mountain range, ride my utility vehicle with my brother-in-law. That's what I'd like to do in the summer. How's that? That's a good answer. You got another question for me? Well, since you sold your uh, Broken Skull Ranch, are you still doing the show? Yes, we are still doing the Broken Skull Challenge. We never filmed it in South Texas. We filmed that right, set right outside of L.A., and we start filming about July 21st. So stay tuned. This is going to be season five, and this is going to be the biggest, baddest, most epic season ever. Hey, I appreciate you calling in, man. Let's go to Adila. Oh, my God. Hi. I'm, I'm doing very well. Thank you. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. Did I pronounce your name correctly? You did. You did. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking my call. I, um, I know you have uh, a, a lot of um, calls on cue, so I'm just going to keep it very quick. My question for you, sir, is just to to get an understanding of your your take on the business right now. Do you think, you know, not having competition right now between federations is hurting the product? Um, just because you were kind of in, in the in the, leading the way, really, during the Monday Night Wars uh, back in '98. So I just wanted to get your your viewpoint on that. And the other question I had was, um, do you see yourself getting involved, um, you know, with some of the newer talent at the Performance Center? First of all. I think competition is paramount. I wish there was another WCW around. Uh, it was so fun back in the Monday Night Wars to go head-to-head with those guys. They were pulling out everything but the kitchen sink. We were doing the same, and they kicked our ass in the ratings for about two years, and then we turned the tables on them. But each product was at its absolute best or was striving to be from a writing and performance standpoint and storyline telling standpoint. So competition is key. Uh, WWE is the holy grail. It is the major leagues. It always has been. And WCW has put up uh, you know, a valiant fight back in the day. And back in the day, I was in WCW fighting WWF. So competition is king. I wish there was another federation for WWE. And as far as am I going to make any more uh, appearances as far as being with a superstar? What was that question? 
Oh, no, I was just curious about your, just because I, I've noticed a lot of Hall of Famers are getting involved with um, a lot of the newer talent at the Performance Centre, and you were just sort of, I don't think anybody touches you from a promo standpoint and even just your skills as a wrestler, so I just wasn't sure if you're mentoring a lot of the newer, newer you know, superstars that are coming in. Oh, I appreciate that, but uh, I, I wouldn't say I'm mentoring anybody right now, but I'd love to, if I can ever get time, and uh, people kid me about this all the time because I've been saying I would like to go to the NXT Performance Center to talk to those kids, but just the schedule never does open up for me to do so. But I know they have a world-class training facility down there, but you have to have different banks of knowledge stop through there and keep giving you more knowledge so you hear it from everybody. And they've had some great ones down there. I would like to be on that list of great ones to help them in their endeavors to become the biggest draw in the history of the business. I'd love to do that. That uh, that would be so great to see, sir. Thank you so much for making, uh, you know, my childhood as as great as it was. Uh, you know, you're a hero to a lot of us. So thank you so much for everything that you brought to the business. Hey, I had a great time. I appreciate your support, and I appreciate you calling in all, all the way from Toronto, Canada. <laughs> no, thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. Take care. We'll go to Nicholas. Hey, Steve. <laughs> How's it going? It's going all right. Mine's getting kind of blown right now. I can't believe I'm talking to you. What do you want to talk about tonight? I just, I just want to ask you, uh, what was your favorite uh, Stone Cold Center, and who was it on? Man, there's been so many. I always loved Stunning the Rock because the way he sold that damn thing, you never like knew a- what he was going to do next. And so it, he was just, like, amazing. As far as... My favorite stunner had to be the first one on Vince McMahon, and I was on Monday Night Raw, but it was the first time, you know, Vince had ever taken a stunner, first time I'd ever give it to him, and that caught the attention of the world, really. People talked about that, and they got into that feud, and I loved working with that guy. So that that stunner right there would probably be the most important stunner in my career, other than the one I hit Shawn Michaels with for my first championship, but as far as importance to the Stone Cold character and starting a hell of a run, stunning Vince McMahon for the first time. Good deal. That is awesome. Yeah, you're one of my favorite wrestlers, and I grew up watching you. All right, gang, thanks again for all the calls. Like I said, we'll be running all the calls on upcoming Unleashed shows. So if you didn't hear your call today, you will in a future show. And I got Wade Keller standing by. We're going to get to him right after this. My name is Raven, professional wrestling superstar, raconteur extraordinaire, and uh, other adjectives. Or is it adverbs? Anyway, join me in a motley assortment of friends, enemies, ne'er-do-wells, and know-nothings as we banter about all kinds of nonsense every Monday here at the Jericho Network on Podcast One. Download and listen to the show on PodcastOne.com, the Podcast One app, and Apple Podcasts. Quote to Raven, nevermore. Steve Austin. Steve Austin. Unleashed. Unleashed. All right, here we go. Wade Keller, weekly update on the Thursday Steve Austin Show Unleashed podcast. Wade, how are you? I'm doing great. Back home, settled in. No more uh, no more mile-high elevation causing me to get winded doing the show. It's all good. And you got all settled back in in many, and I'm over here in L.A., and I had technology problems. God dang, we're sitting there trying to do this update every single week, and we're going to keep this one short and concise. <laughs> I turn on Monday Night Raw, and the first thing is... I got no satellite. My satellite dish will not communicate with my box. My wife starts jumping through the hoops, call the technicians. About an hour and a half later, we got squat to this day. As I record this podcast, I don't have anything. So I had to go to the WWE.com website, watch a few highlights. Uh, so I have some of my picks. But let's go through this thing in kind of a, a semi-rapid-fire fashion. Let's see if we can keep this thing around the 20-minute mark. I know when you and I start talking to business pro wrestling, it's easy to spend all on and on and on but first off i know you got some heads ups you want to throw out there wade uh one regarding your podcast and two uh regarding cody Rhodes. um yeah yeah well i'll get i'll get just a quick plug out of the way i announced last week on your show that the uh that my show that i currently do four days a week uh that's available at pwtorchlivecast.com there's a whole bunch of shows on that on that uh network that i do or that our team does at the Torch. My four shows are going to be moving to Podcast One next month. Um, they'll be debuting the week of July 10th or the 17th, and so we're going to do four shows a week. One on Monday nights that'll go up early Tuesday, uh, covering Raw. One that'll be available late 
Tuesday night or early Wednesday covering SmackDown. And there are going to be very specific topics. We're going to just go in-depth on Raw with co-hosts and emails and discussions. And then uh, the Thursday show will be kind of a flagship where we talk about a broad array of topics. And then the Friday show is going to be an interview, a weekly interview. And you can subscribe right now. There, the, there's only a 75-second teaser up right now when you subscribe. Uh, but you can go to iTunes right now and enter Wade Keller and the Wade Keller Pro Wrestling Podcast logo and, and feed will pop up. And you can start subscribing now. So um, go for that. It'll start to propagate through all the uh, podcast manager apps out there. But I'm excited to start with Podcast One, and it's a great opportunity. And I hope all of your listeners who enjoy the wrestling talk will follow me over there, too, for even more. Outstanding. And let's talk about a little bit of uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling action coming up in uh, Los Angeles, actually in the Long Beach area, July 1st, July 2nd. Uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling coming to town. I know I've got a couple of guys from New Japan coming to my podcast. They won't be on in time to plug that show, so I'm giving that date to everybody in the Los Angeles area. I think both shows are indeed sold out, but check Long Beach uh, is the venue. Check out the building, and they are coming to town on July 1st and 2nd as I have some of those cats rolling over here for the podcast. Uh, As far as other updates, Wade, what you got? Well, Cody, just Cody Rhodes won the uh, ROH World Title Friday on their pay per view. Beat Christopher Daniels. Now he's going into the weekend with a match against Okada, and so it's just it's a big week for Cody Rhodes. Um, uh, obviously, I mean a big month for Cody Rhodes to go from uh, you know being a post WWE guy, getting his footing outside of WWE, and I'm sure I mean he was confident that what he was doing would uh, th- that he had the talent to make it work without WWE's machinery behind him and and I know a lot of people in WWE like Cody and we're wishing him luck and it was a good move for him this is really showing he is earning the respect uh, of everybody out there who's not part of the WWE machine I mean New Japan has confidence in him to put him in a main event match against their top guy on the LA show Ring of Honor has confidence to give him the uh, the, the run with the ROH world title this is a you know, in terms of a non WWE wrestler, Cody's one of the biggest stories this year, and uh, I, I'm curious how he comes across Saturday. This is a big test for him to show that he can look like he belongs against somebody at Okada's level, who's just the best in the business right now. So I, I'm really looking forward, just kind of on a personal level, following Cody's career, seeing style-wise how that matchup works, and and kind of, you kind of see what his upside is as a worker outside of WWE. And a good match Friday night and uh, has had a reputation for having good matches, but not great matches yet. And Okada is that opportunity. So that's one talking point this week going into the weekend. And I'll tell you what, you know, uh, shout out and props to Cody Rhodes for having the success he's had. Because, man, once you jump off the machine, you try to test your, the waters on your own, and you're able to have the kind of success that he's had, man, that speaks volume. So, man, I'm proud of him because that's a big leap, and it's a leap of faith. And, and you're, you're banking on yourself and taking a chance on yourself and believing in yourself that you can cash in. And it looks with what's happening that he is. So we'll see how the match goes with Okada. I wish him nothing but the best. That's a big leap when you jump from you know the biggest employer in the world uh, and go out on your own and find your way. And I know uh, that that took a lot of balls to do that. So props to Cody Rhodes for doing that. We'll see how his future goes. But congrats to him so far along the way. Hey, uh, I've got notes all over the place here with respect yeah. to Raw and SmackDown. Just the way I had to look at the highlights on WWE.com. Uh, one of the things that jumped off at me was the Big Cass Enzo reunion slash other heel turn by Cass and right here in my notes I have very nice really good promo by both guys really good by, uh, by Cass because sometimes he can go out there and get that deer in the headlights look but he just came he was very sincere uh, Enzo uh, off the charts good acting with tears in his eyes and boy I tell you what they pulled it off inside the ring you, you thought something was going to come here but they didn't give it to you and right as they're riding off in the sunset all is well in Shangri-La and then bam, it's the big clothesline by Cass. Double cross on the ramp. He feathers uh, the action by throwing Enzo down the ramp like a piece of trash. Really thought it was a nice segment. Showed uh, big Cass in a great light. And also Enzo was was spectacular as well. But uh, really nice job here. What did you think about the heat going to big Cass? Because there was legit heat there. I, I loved it. I, I watched that and I thought to myself, I don't want anyone to tell me kayfabe is dead everybody knows it's scripted so we need to have shades of gray there's no shades of gray there are people like denzo 
They dislike Cass. The acting was great. You're right. Enzo two years ago, watch go watch some NXT shows from a couple years ago. Enzo looked had a little deer in a headlights look. He didn't exude that confidence that you need to be a top heel or babyface. He's confident now. The, I thought the, the, I mean, there was a lot of good stuff, and, and you and I agree, on, on the acting and the tears and the emotions. They had me buying it. I, I'm sitting here processing in my head, okay, who are they going to feud with next? Now that they've decided to put off the, the breakup till later, it was so convincing. And what jumped out to me is at the very end, Cass looking at the crowd after he turned, at Enzo, turned on Enzo, and the way that he looked at the crowd and talked trash to them afterwards – I thought that was a money moment. That convinced me more than anything else that he had done, that he's ready. He doesn't have that, yeah, the deer in the headlights or whatever it was that stopped him from breaking out. I I think he's going to be a money heel. But I also want to give credit to Enzo. I I think a lot of people were were thinking, oh, you know, Enzo and Cass together, um, they're greater than the the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And if you separate them, they're not going to be that that good. I mean, that might turn out to be the case, but Enzo showed a lot more range here than we've seen because he's usually the goofball in the funny hat with the funny hair, doing the funny lines, doing the majority of the talking, but it's all kind of you know frivolous stuff. He showed some acting range here. I think if they did not have big plans for Enzo after the last two weeks, I think they need to rethink that and figure out how they can make money and put Enzo in a position to contribute. Yeah, but I'd like to – I would say no, I wouldn't put him in the goofball category. I would I would categorize him as that wild card guy with some it factor there uh, yeah. because, yeah, he can be over the top. But I wouldn't call him a goofball because that's almost uh, an insult. He's just that guy. He He's charismatic. He has a way with words. He has a presence. Sometimes he gets a little spun up in it. But uh, anyway, nice job. But I don't, I don't want to write him off as a jaybrone here. I thought he, I thought he did a great job here, and he, he's great on the stick, and he has a great persona. And, and yeah, and I, and I think that was a perception of him. I think that he showed there's more there. Eric Young, for instance, who's in NXT now, Insanity, in TNA, he did a lot of light, frivolous, goofball comedy, and then he got serious and kind of channeled Mad Dog Buzz Sawyer. And I'm wondering if there isn't something Enzo can do. He's not going to be a great, flashy, cruiserweight worker. No. Uh, but if he can cha- like yeah like you're saying if he can channel kind of do what eric young did channel the mad dog unpredictable crazed there's a vicious side to him um a little bit what flyboy rock or rock did in ecw where it was sing song so all smiles and then boom he could turn in an instant and you'd be like oh crap this guy's got got street toughness too i hope they i hope enzo and wwe go that direction with him he showed me a lot in this in, in the last two weeks too but Cass, i'm excited about i now we got to see him hold his own in some singles matches on the main event scene Again, all he has to do is great, just good, solid work. Don't work like a cruiserweight. Don't worry about yep. taking the big bumps. Just work logic. Be mean. Be vicious. Sell when it's your time to sell. Don't turn into super coward mode. Don't oversell. Just sell and learn. Sometimes working against guys that are smaller than you, register. And then if they get you into sell mode, then sell, but be vicious in your heat. Good luck to Big Cash. Good luck to both of them. Steve, real quick before you flip to the next subject, on Cass, who should he study tapes of over the decades? Man, I, man, that's a good question. Uh, just from, uh, you know, if you say babyface, I say Barry Windham. But right now, in, in the heel vein that he's going, I just maybe even heel Barry Windham. But I like Barry better as a baby. I don't want to say Bruiser because I mean, anybody can study Bruiser just because of just the generality of what he did was awesome. Uh, just off the cuff, it's hard for me to pinpoint someone that I would say, hey, big cast as a pretty pretty good size heel. Here's who you should study. So I'd have to get back to you on. On that note, who would you say? Um, I'd say some Kevin Nash, uh, because Kevin Nash, by necessity, wrestled a big man style. But he carried himself in the ring deliberately and and with confidence and exuded that confidence and used his size. But there's, you know, he's there's some Barry Windham in him and that there's more natural athleticism. Even just Rick Root. Rick Root wasn't a big man wrestler, but Rick Root was never did he didn't do flashy stuff. What he did looked badass incredible so i mean it's just i i didn't plan my answer either i'd have to think about it but just think about not yeah like you said don't don't be trying to do dives and top rope moves 
focus on being tough and credible and carrying yourself like not that you're in no hurry that it becomes boring but that you're not trying to impress the crowd you're trying to win matches what i'm waiting for wade right now is the next guy to really step up and show intensity and a little bit more mean streak i talk about this all the time no one has really really done it braun Strowman has you know there's there's a couple of guys like a brock lesnar or you know like like a, a john cena just for respect when it comes time to deliver offense so when i when i don't include cer- certain names because they're already there. I'm talking about this new group of guys. I'm just still waiting for that next guy to just to jump out because of intensity. So if there's one thing I would say to Big Cass, intensity. And when you when I say intensity, I don't mean in, in a just fast forward pace of rushing things. It's just with just delivery and execution and just that demeanor with which you wait, with which you carry yourself. So that would be something that I would say for Big Cass to focus on. But let's move on down the road. Is Roman Reigns on Monday Night Raw? Yeah, he is. Okay, let's stay here then. I got the Roman promo. He accepts the ambulance match at Great Balls of Fire. I have in my notes, Roman was great. Braun is terrific. I'm looking forward to this match. Roman came out here, delivered this promo. He goes, hey, man, I might have something you guys like. And, you know, then as an aside, I mean, he's really starting to loosen up, and he's really yes. playing this straight down the middle. Whether you like him or you hate him, he's just playing it, and he's starting to loosen up and show some personality, and I like it. Uh, so I'm looking forward uh, to see Roman keep developing. He's getting to me. Here's another guy who's getting some confidence behind him, and whether they're booing him or cheering him, and, they, man, they damn near blew the roof off for of Braun. But whatever role Roman's in, he's really settling into the groove here. Uh, I have Braun is really over as a baby Roman continues to get over I'm looking forward to to this match what did you think about the segment performance yeah I I think both came across as stars I don't think Braun Strowman threw his arm I don't think Braun Strowman threw his arms into the air and yelled multiple times Steve did you notice that yes I did and I think that's great (laughs) yeah Uh, I don't know where we're going to land with uh, how fans react to Braun Strowman and how they react to Roman Reigns but I think feel like that's okay at this point it is like i i i believe that the fans very very much liked enzo and disliked Cass. i think they are that there there are times that fans absolutely are cheering for the baby face booing the heel and everybody's doing their job and everybody's cast well and it just plays out well with this it's intriguing because the fans kind of like braun i think he's destined to be kind of like a cane, you know, a, a guy who's who turns babyface and he's the monster who fights for right, but is willing to go to certain extremes to do it, and against the right heel, a, Bron, uh, a Baron Corbin type, fans will look forward to and pay for it. But I totally agree with you. Roman loosening up and being more real, less corporate, less tied to less tied to scripted lines, more reacting to the crowd, is the right direction for him to go. Now telling an audience booing him you're going to like this because i'm going to talk about somebody samoa joe you know destroying me in the ring um it's interesting i mean i i don't know where it goes but i think it's better to follow this natural path of him letting loose a little bit than it is to just white knuckle your way through babyface promos where everybody boos you so i'm intrigued and i'm intrigued with where they land at SummerSlam too but it's I mean, almost I, I a slight sarcasm self-deprecating yeah. and so it's like hey you know, say, yeah, I'm still okay. I used to really not like this guy, but okay, I get it. And he's not taking himself so seriously. You know, he's kind of letting you off the hook. You make the decision, but he really doesn't give a damn. And so he's. I just think he's going straight down the road. He continues to get loose, and I like it. And just a little bit more personality, that guy, because he does have personality. But he's, and I, I don't. I have zero. Uh, I just, just keep doing what you're doing, Roman. You're getting it. Now the crowd is booing him louder than ever. I mean, he's and that's stood cool. There and they, that's cool. Yeah, but it's that reaction, and that means the kid is getting over. It's just what I still worry about is if the crowds keep booing him and he keeps facing heels, that the crowds are going to cheer the heels and boo him, and it's just going to mess things up a little bit. I mean, ideally, everybody's cast, everybody's slotted in a way where the heels don't go from being booed in, against AJ Styles to cheered against Roman to then being booed against the next babyface they wrestle. At some, I'm just saying at some point, this isn't ideal and I don't think it's long term, but I think it's part of a journey to something and I think the journey we're on now is better than where, where, the, where Roman was four months ago. It, yeah, the journey, it's still a work in progress, so you can still make those adjustments from week to week but at least getting through this match I think is going to be fine, but I agree, yeah, long term yeah, I think you kind of need to make it 
decision as far as, you know, you just can't slide him against a heel and then a baby or he's always going to be the heel just because. So yeah. he, he, he does need some distinct direction but I think it's the last year has been kind of chaotic you know from the when they tried to turn him baby it didn't work so much because people thought they were shoving him too hard for all the reasons the writing reasons and then the force line so just it's yep. finally starting to feel natural so I'm happy for him and and he just looks loads more comfortable I do I agree and I mean that's that's what we talked about with cast some of it is just fans pick up on fear and nervousness and discomfort and inauthenticity and and I think there's something about Roman that feels more authentic right now and I think that's step one to getting him to because he's super talented super charismatic has a great presence but there's other things on the other side of the ledger working against him and one of those was inauthenticity maybe the biggest one and so if they can check that box and move it to the other side now we're talking big money not just wwe having to talk about a thunderous reaction while trying to figure out well it's the wrong reaction if he can feel authentic i think fans are going to be more willing to be loyal to him and the wwe brand however he is presented and he, and to wrap it up he is definitely feeling more like a superstar i agree yep Hey, let's talk about the Paul Heyman promo. I kind of started watching Paul cut this promo, and because I was running short on time, just kind of fast forward it because it said on the headline that Brock's going to get choked out by Samoa Joe, and I'm watching the Paul promo, and well, there was the story. Paul's done the promo, brings down the Beast Incarnate, Brock Lesnar, Samoa Joe, Shang has him from behind, boom, goes to choke him out. Brock throws him up against that that, that teleprompter, that, that gigantic Titan Tron, whatever you call it. It, but man was just trying like hell to get Joe off of his back, almost succeeded. And it was just a great segment, man. By the end of it, Brock was turning purple, damn near choked him out, slipped that, uh, that elbow, that, that were the bottom part of Joe's arm underneath that chin because it looked like it was damn near a shoot. And boy, I tell you what, the, the babies came out there and separated those two, and Brock was in cell mode, and Joe looked like a junkyard dog, mad as hell, mean, and just was ready to beat the hell out of Brock. I thought it was executed awesomely. Here, here's my question for you. Um, you've been on both sides of the ledger as an established top guy with people wanted to come up and test the main event waters. You spent a lot of years as a guy testing the main event waters and other people had political power or had established themselves as main eventers. Right now, Heyman and Lesnar are at the top and Joe's the new guy, veteran, highly respected, main evented a lot of places and had great matches. He's not a rookie by any means, but he's trying to establish I can be a top money draw in WWE in the top, top mix. But to get there, ultimately you need the backing of the booker and the promoter or the wrestler you're working with. And I'm sensing Heyman and Lesnar, who have some pull, and Heyman's a genius in the wrestling context and probably any context, um, I'm sensing they are they look at Joe and go, we want to make this guy. And we're willing to cash in some chips that we don't use on a Dean Ambrose, or, you know, pick your guy that they've, they've wrestled. We, we want to make this guy. I'm sensing... No matter what happens between Joe and Lesnar, Joe's going to come out of it stronger, and Heyman and Lesnar are going to be part of making that happen. Are, are you picking up on that? Because you've, you've, I'm sure you've sensed at times over the years when you were working with main event guys, this guy's on my side trying to help me, or this guy's trying to get through this feud and isn't buying me as a guy. No, he sees me as a threat. Yeah, I, I think, no, I think Brock is, man, he's such a great business guy, and I think there's mutual respect there, and I know Paul, he probably loves Joe, and I just think, yeah, they're trying like hell to, to help get this guy over to the next level. Joe's done a great job of getting himself over, and just going down that, that road of just, that was that intensity level that I really wanted to see from Joe. You know, sometimes, you know, when he would have those great matches with, what was his, uh, Who's the, the Japanese wrestler they used to always uh, wrestle over there in uh, Ring of Honor? Because he had some class. Was it Masawa or was it Kabashi? Um, but sometimes in those matches, I can't remember who it was, but that sometimes there's a lack. You know, they would be going 30, 35, 40 minutes. So sometimes there was that lack of sense of urgency on some of the false finishes that, that could have been yeah. there. So if he can just employ it, what, that, that, that look that he gave Brock at the end, just that, that's, that's the spark that I needed to see out of Joe, just a little bit more meanness. I know you're mean to begin with, Joe. I know you're a technician. You're one of the best workers in the world. But just give me a little bit of that, hey, fuck you, got. So I'm sorry to cuss. This is my only 
face show, but you know, we're talking about wrestling. I mean, the, yeah. Joe really made me feel at the end that God dang, he wants that belt, and that's the only thing that 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 intensity that I've really been looking to see from Joe, and he delivered. So I thought it was an outstanding job. To, to answer your question, yes, I think Brock and Paul want to help this guy out as much as possible. Whether who goes over, you probably think just looking on paper, it's going to be Brock because of where we're, we're going in the future. But yes, Joe will come out of this winning or losing further up than he was when he started. Absolutely. And, and I also want to compliment Heyman's promo later in the show um, when he reacted to what happened. The, the line where he predicted Lesnar will finally take Joe to Suplex City and hit an F5, and after Joe is victimized and emasculated and his manhood has crawled up inside his stomach, he'll look up at his trainer and say, oh, dear God, is that what it's like to fight the beast? Goodness gracious, great balls of fire. <laughs> I popped. Oh, it was, it was, it was Kevin Spacey. Uh, ask in the way that he delivered that line with a little southern twang at the end I I just popped that was one of my favorite Paul Heyman moments of the past couple years your manhood crawling up inside your stomach and you'll look up at the trainer and say oh dear god I mean just great Paul Heyman I mean well, uh, that sounds like that's a money promo I missed it on the highlights that I watched I won't go back and try to find that but that is <laughs> absolute awesome gold I mean and Paul Heyman's been laying down gold for a long time but the way you just delivered that coming from you that you said what Paul Heyman said speaks volumes so yeah that's awesome and when you get a chance to go back and recap something like that and further set up this match and you know like we were talking a few weeks ago what kind of what kind of match is this what's the style and so now, you know, you get in, we'll see how this thing goes. You know, the first five, eight, ten minutes, what is it going to be? Tit for tat or filling each other out or finally he does go into suplex city and then just starts taking Joe all over town and then Joe does something to stop him and then sets in the heat or just uh, his offense. So, you know, so it, it's going it, to, they're really building this thing nicely. I love it. Yeah. And, and I mean, the if Joe – and he showed it uh, against Kobashi in ROH. If Joe can channel that kind of – and he can. I mean, he's older now, but he can channel that kind of credible style. And the way that Lesnar sold for him on the stage to build up, that this is a killer hold that can even take out the beast. And then to have Heyman say it's going to be a different story at the pay-per-view. This is – you know, there are still money players in pro wrestling, people who can sell tickets with a promo or an angle. And Brock and Heyman – and now I'm putting Joe in that mix – I think they're using Joe pitch, just pitch perfect how Joe should be used. And uh, a credit to WWE for presenting this as serious business because that's what that's when you get into, to me, the serious stuff is, is the best stuff. And you can have entertainment in there, uh, a dash of humor. Uh, but the bulk of, to me, wrestling that draws money or draws viewers is serious business. This is serious business. Well done. Uh, money in the bank. Carmella cashes in. Well, she didn't cash in. She ends up winning again with... Uh, what's his name? What's his name? James, James Ellsworth. Yeah. yeah. James Ellsworth. Uh, James yeah. Ellsworth. God dang. That guy's entertaining as hell. Thought it was barred from the building. Whatever happened. Uh, I just saw the highlights. And so Carmella ends up with the briefcase. Uh, I like this because I didn't get a chance to see the match, but I like this because I liked her with the briefcase to begin with. Had she wanted on her own. Uh, again, as I stated uh, a week or two ago, her, her promos have really been coming out. Her character is really starting to come out. She's starting to really, uh, just be get more confidence and get on a little little a roll here so uh, i was down with it i didn't get a chance to see all of the matches just a few of the highlights hey man those are risky matches uh james ellsworth finally pulled off that bump i was talking about last week the <laughs> splitter on the top rope gets him out of the way and carmella gets a briefcase your thoughts yeah um i i i I'm happy Carmella won again because I think she, we talked about it last week. She's so good with a briefcase, gloating about it. It's still kind of iffy from a credibility standpoint for Daniel Bryan to say James Ellsworth's banned from the building and then James Ellsworth ends up interfering. And to frame this as, well, Carmella – I mean, Carmella's a heel. She shouldn't win fair and square because there's not a lot of heat there if she does other than her gloating over the top in an over-the-top way. Her character needs to gloat, and but her character needs to gloat and take credit for something she didn't accomplish on her own. So she still has that now. 
And so I like the finish in that respect, but I want Daniel Bryan next week to show some authority that, yeah, we're not going to undo this match because at least you did unclip the briefcase this time, but Ellsworth interfering is not acceptable. He is banned from the building. He needs to do something in response. And I don't know if that's fine and suspend James Ellsworth for a month, whatever. Do something so it, fans don't feel like his words don't mean anything. He can't just shrug his shoulders and go, well, I wish we had better security to keep the guy out. That's not enough. So that's my critique of the story. But that said, I'm happy where they landed. And, and, and I think Becky now has another case. I'm t- you know, she's frustrated. I'm playing yep. it fair and square. And she's the one who had to deal with Ellsworth. Ellsworth threw Carmella into the ring. Becky was going to win or look like she might be able to win. And she had to deal with Ellsworth tipping the ladder over, knocking him onto the top rope. She climbs quickly for the briefcase, but Carmella's had all this time to recover because Ellsworth was in the way. So Becky now can continue her journey, too, of being frustrated, trying to play it by the rules and not and having things work against her. Okay, let's move on. Let's, one of the things that jumped off to me on SmackDown was Sasha Banks going over in a gauntlet match. And I thought this was uh, a nice setup from the highlights I saw because my DirecTV went out with Nia eliminating everyone in the ring. And so finally, when it came down to Nia versus Sasha Banks, surely you felt this was going to be the same thing because she was the biggest woman in there she's really coming around she's turned into a really good worker and not so fast my friend Sasha Banks over with the bank statement winning the gauntlet match thereby setting up a match between herself and Alexa Bliss who came out uh, drop kicked by Sasha picks up the belt there's a tease there to Alexa setting up this match is that great balls of fire where this match will happen um yeah I well yeah, yeah, I think it has to. Or is it just saying, "Hey, I, I, I'm you know looking at taking. Uh, I got a shot at your title now." Because what was I, that? I think, oh no, it was well, it was it was number one contendership. But okay. I think I think that it'll it's I think it's probably a given that it'll end up at uh, 